Hi. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, and uh, uh, I recognize many of you from last night's reading uh, by Fanny. Uh, and so I won't bore you with another extended uh, didactic introduction. Um, but let me say how happy. <laughs> Well, no, no. I was going to start talking about the dinosaur they just discovered. The old museum. Um, uh, so Fanny's going to be talking to us about a visual um, art uh, project and collaboration uh, that she's been uh, that she's actually completed, and uh, and then after her kind of presentation of the work, uh, we'll have time for a conversation. So um, and we have coffee or whatever. So I'll be sauced. Um, and uh, thanks to uh, the Logan Foundation um, for helping make this event possible. Thank you. So I'm going to um, the sort of me give a meandering and um, peculiar talk or whatever um, about this project that I did with. Um, a, a, anthropologist and photographer, filmmaker, named Robert Gardner. He teaches at Harvard, and he's all he did. He used to, now he is a, an old man, but um, he's been in charge of the film center at Harvard for years, and made these, he made four really great films going way, way out into the wilds of the world, of people um, generally involved in some kind of a ritual, a like a burial ritual in India and a war ritual in an African tribe. And um, they always sort of teeter on the edge of um, the kind of, uh, not mystical really, but, but the edge where there are no answers around things. So that they're really poetic, beautiful, but very factually precise films. So I'm going to um, start the images flowing. If my friend is here to do that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it doesn't go through doors. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to be showing some still pic their stills, Polaroids, that move while I talk. Um, like so many other writers and poets, I'm thinking a great deal about the visual image as a partner to language. I've made three videos with voiceover and have seen hundreds of paintings that contain words, especially since the 60s. Um, the, the most successful collaborations I ever saw were in children's books, and uh, William Blake, of course, and um, maybe medieval manuscripts. And a long time when novels used to have like about four illustrated pages with a little bit of dialogue underneath them. I, those were always just marvels to me. But I think it's problematic, a difficulty, putting images with words or words with images. The photographer here, uh, Robert Gardner, got in touch with me in 2011 and asked if I would look at a set of photographs he had taken in 1981 and respond to them however I wanted. He had an art book in mind. I love his film, so of course I said I would try. The pictures of the Ica people in the mountains of northern Colombia. These are them. They are a living remnant They're, uh, of Mayan civilization, just a little break off group. For centuries, they've been resisting absorption into the modern world by continuing to live according to traditions that link them to each other and the spirit world. They've stayed close together with a shaman guiding them and have communicated telepathically. I had already seen Gardner's film of the people all together, but this set was focused just on the women and children. As an experiment, Gardner and his camera stayed at a remove in a fixed position and clicked every 20 seconds for half an hour. 87 of the Polaroid snapshots survived after being stuck into a dark place for over 30 years. And that's what he pulled out. He 
I took the contact sheets back to where I was living on a half deserted island in midwinter with trees like electric wires, yellow January skies, and a foghorn lowing like a cow in the sky. I was already working on something else there with full concentration, so I lay the photos out on the table like tarot cards where I could wander over to look at them on and off for days, even for weeks, arranging, rearranging, and taking little notes for the book now called In and Out. These Polaroid snapshots are focused on one door in one dwelling where mothers, children, and animals pass in and out of darkness. The people and place couldn't be more foreign to me. The toddler and languid girls look at the eye of the land camera unselfconsciously, except for the mother. The first peeling back of the Polaroid skin, which is how you used to see what you just shot, um, to see what was captured in a blink must have been like watching minuscule forms of life coming to light under a microscope. The colors in these Polaroids are pale and indefinite, the way instant film often was. This doesn't capture the sort of um, sepia pallor of the actual pictures. I had to lean very close to see what was there and use a magnifying glass. The motion of the people would convey their intentions and of course there was none, only shifts in posture with a blackout between. As you can see, the people seem to be covered in a celestial light and to pause in archetypally angelic postures. They're dressed in rough whites like the clouds in the sky, but the white in these pictures is pale gold. What is the color gold? I guess it's the first color because it isn't a color at all. It's an element and a blend of yellow and red. At the same time, gold covers as much as shade does. It works around the clock to make itself known on the surface of things. Goethe, in his theory of color, wrote, the highest degree of light, such as that of the sun, is for the most part colorless. This light, however, seen through a medium, but very slightly thickened, appears to us yellow. In the still Polaroid shot, the ones that are in here, if you want to pass this around, because they are different from what you're seeing, um, the pale cold gold light suffuses the image that's weighed down equally by shadows. The posture each person assumes is stopped mid-motion. When I made my videos, I was hoping to be able to show them instead of myself at public events. I've always believed that absence is an ideal condition. So <laughs> it seemed that making a film was one way to pull that off. And um, at the same time, I've, I'm so in love with film that, that it's where I'm happiest. In the case of these photographs by Gardner, I tried to be as uninvolved as the camera and to produce comments that were completely impersonal. Nonetheless, my fatal tendency towards narrative kept interfering, and I moved the pictures this way and that, trying to find some story. Would the children of the Ica people survive this moment at all that was um, filmed in 1981? And um, I would say no. They would have been absorbed into the consumerist society that was slowly eating its way up towards them. But there's, uh, I think of when Tolstoy said, well, at last we won't have to write all those descriptions again, when he saw a movie for the first time. Um, so uh, where I was living, there was a late March blizzard that brought hazards like ice and breaking branches outside the house. A small smell of, a strong smell of leaking oil gave me a headache, and the only movie theater was closed. I played with the photographs, inventing little films I could make with them, and turned happily then towards developing theories. Because what else do you do? <laughs> I realized that color has something to do with time. Perhaps because light and time are so bonded, we see them collaborate all day in shifts in tone and length of shadow. Color appears to be stuck inside shapes and to be unable to move. Therefore, it can be moved, it has to be moved. Is color possessed by the thing or by the optic system that happens to take it in? So far, Stan Brakhage, the American experimental filmmaker, 
has resonated most with me when he talks about the mystical experience of film. His interests in the body and God come out in his own work and often in his remarks. Suppose the vision of the saint and the artist to be an increased ability to see. Vision, he wrote. Motion, this is still him, motion pictures are a medium of both supernature and underworld, an instrument in unveiling the natural through reflection, and also the gateway for an alien world underneath the surface of our natural visual ability, an underworld that erupts into ours through every machine which makes visible to us what we cannot naturally sense. So there's this kind of horror level to film, too. He, he wrote of the filmmaker Georges Méliès when he first saw, quote, the beam of widening illumination. This is Méliès when he first saw a film. The beam of widening illumination as a hallway he might almost climb, diminishing in size until he'd perhaps vanished into the tunnel of the lens. He knew from experience that any step into the light would tear his shadow off his back and hurl him against the screen behind. And so at first he avoided bodily intruding upon the apparitions of this machine. So there, I, I was sort of entering into the zone of the hallucinatory the more time I spent on this. And then it, I began to wonder how can words add anything to an image that already goes beyond itself. The eco women and children in these pictures were in a strange way like words that recede into darkness and emerge again into the outer air. What's so difficult about putting images and written words together is that words collaborate so incessantly with a sky dark interior silence that they cannot survive the power of the image that lives on light. Words are made in darkness, spoken or written. Pinning words onto pictures is as delicate as pinning an insect onto a board. If the insect were alive, no matter how small, it would be a cruel act, not a specimen. If it's not alive, it reminds us only of its use value through its wings and tiny legs. The coming to life of pictures that have no motion in them is already a surreal event. Words can't do that. The intrusion of the subtitle is the best we can get as it fades into the background, white, the, the background that's either white or black on the moving image behind it. Spoken words emerge from your mouth backwards into the ears of the listener and from your hands onto the screen as something you can only comprehend in reverse. What can the stillness of words give to a picture that's still and both of them silent? These poetic stills are photographs first, but they are also almost footage for a film. I moved them in any formation I wanted and filled in the blanks and went with a shutter space or not. But I had to choose one direction, one sequence of shapes and colors that would please me by reminding me of something else. Almost my first impression of these photographs is of human beings at the edge of annihilation, people living apart from the modern world in literal flight from it, nonviolent and in continual relationship to darkness and invisible beings. I also see a dance of the daily caught and stopped, shot by shot. When I did a little research, I found out that they eat a stew made of yucca, potatoes, and plantains. They have eggs, bananas, corn, beans, and coffee, and they sell sugar paste. The people work hard and are not starving. But I'm not an anthropologist or a scholar. What I was looking for in these Polaroids was a poetic structure, not a case study. In the movie that um, Gardner made on all the people, um, which is a regular feature-length film, shows the shaman um, who's this beautiful, very um, sort of meditative, intelligent man, and children climbing all over him, and he sits very still, and he does communicate with his hands um, as if there were little wires attached, telling people 
what next or what he was thinking or sending out signals. So it was really quite, it made such an impression. I couldn't just deal with these as material events for them. Um, so what is a poetic structure to me? It, it's what I described as a hut in this poem from my most recent book, which I'll read now. It's a short three stanzas. Up the hill is a hut made of sound, where two windows rhyme and the tiles stay on, because they are nailed to a dream. The dreamer wonders, can this be mine? The floor is solid and straight and is amber from sap. The walls don't leak or let out heat from gray embers in the grate. This is the original home at the heart of brutalist design. No storm can slam its shape apart. No thief can carry it off. It dwells in ashen buildings where the present sleeps. And I was looking at, in these for a um, kind of stable interior, something that mirrored in and out for me. Uh, something as recognizable to me as it would be to a 14th century laundress who was washing some lace and saw in the lace something she recognized. And only recently did I learn that the effects of films are very similar to hallucinations, which are physiologically the same as visual experience. This was Oliver Sacks in his book on hallucinations. Films provide us, of course, as all narrative does, with a story produced in retrospect. You can't tell the story till it's been told. Its creator and editor have composed it from multiple directions, but especially from the end. In this way, films subvert the logic of living as a progressive march forward inside one body into oblivion. They move sideways like an eternal serpent. But when they are poetic, they come from both backwards and in front. They move back and forth, back and forth. Consciousness, too, moves this way. No story reverberates with us unless it's lined up in a logical order best based on invisible, almost mathematical contingencies, the order of desire and fulfillment by someone who has made the ending inevitable. I, I, in, wherever I go, I go down into movies um, in, in every city, whether you have to take a long escalator down or something way up. And it's like coming on an underground river that's eternally going somewhere for me. <laughs> And, oh, this is just an anecdote, but two years ago I took shelter in a religious house, dreary beyond belief, outside Washington, D.C., run by old nuns from far away. And I noticed some female students who were staying there, wandering the halls with their laptops extended like beggar balls, looking for a beam from the internet satellite that might find its way in. Some of them were crouched in corners or literally under tables, hunched over the lighted screen. And I prayed really hard as I was led into my dreary room that the holy signal would follow me into bed in that lonely house so steeped in antiseptic illness. So um, I climbed into bed praying, and miracle of miracles, my prayers were answered. Movies poured into my lap every night for a whole week. <laughs> Netflix, there you are. <laughs> so, um, I didn't know whether to read aloud the little bits that I wrote, ended up writing for the um, book for Gardner. I, I felt, um, I do still have tremendous um, ambivalence about doing the words and, and image those together. I, it so rarely works. So I almost feel as if my attempt is a failure. I mean, it, that it was already a failure even before I did it. Um, and then I had sort of ambivalent feelings also about um, people who are in such terrible peril from the outside world exploiting them in any way and being part of that sort of um, 
move that, that uh, he was, or he, he had already made, Gardner. But um, in the end, it just um, seemed, as I say, like a tarot reading, that I would just try to um, make the images go in the direction of the archetypal rather than the personal. And it wasn't hard to do that. In some way, all things ultimately become subjects for paintings or for stills, because every gesture anybody makes is laden with a great desire or a great hope. And um, so it wasn't hard to do that. But I do, in the end, feel that um, it's it's, I mean, it's my whole um, sort of aesthetic is trying to get away from the personal, uh, dragging the furniture of my life into anything I'm working on. So I've, I've come now, and this is just for me, but I do believe in seeking that, that um, image which is hidden in everything and trying to isolate it. Yes, like an insect. <laughs> and see, see it flat there in front of you. Um, what I found in that, in the process of aging, injury, starvation, or illness, you can become what modern medicine calls confused. The future for decades measured in footfalls going towards a goal turns around on you and comes at you. Passers-by are coming out of their past towards an unknown future that lies behind you. Apparitions in full color dance around you. The concept of a backwards and forwards weakens. Why say east? Why say west? Colors brighten and tears come to your eyes if you look too closely at the purple of a lilac. Every natural piece of the place you are in intensifies in shape and color because it contains within it all the earlier times you saw it. Smell intensifies, but taste weakens, as does hearing. And so, in tiny incremental shifts, the instrument you carry so casually since infancy, your body changes into a new species. You're a different kind of being, unnoticed in society, and conscious of another public, the spirits and goblins and coincident makers that dash around you. You think of a friend, and the friend appears. You dream of a situation, and it's enacted within a week. You're being herded into a waterless lake where what's coming and what has passed twirl around you in concentric circles. So there's no distinction, only circular motion. All this happens when you weaken. It's quite difficult to describe so that anyone believes you or cares because the report you're trying to give is the report of one who is a failure in the busy world. You want to sit safely in the outdoors and watch the habits of animals and cars and complete your daily routines with the devotion of a monastic. You want to go to the movies because there, before the screen, your weirdness is justified. <laughs> Almost identical symptoms of the synesthesia and submersion occur as those you have in extreme weakness. And of course, you're slumped in your chair. In life, this confusion is sometimes called dementia though it could be called avant-garde, because <laughs> the person's highly expressive, unedited language flow, and also the way visitors appear to her as figures empty of historical content, is avant-garde. Father, son, husband, grandson, uncle, and ghost are all one figure, impeccably traced according to gender and cleared of personality. They slip into one iconic shape the basic or paragmatic man. The demented patient really has gone forward ahead of others to the hinterlands of the ahistorical, where everyone is acting as an archetype. And I'm just going to say some lines of Baudelaire. Nature is a temple whose living colonnades breathe forth a mystic speech in fitful sighs. Man wanders among symbols in those glades where all things watch him with familiar eyes, like dwindling echoes gathered far away into a deep and thronging unison, huge as the night or as the light of day, all scents and sounds and colors meet as one. So that says it all for me.
that weird? <laughs> you see, I told you. Um, no, 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 leave it. This is more an observation than a question. I noticed that the, uh, the photographs are all concerned with a displacement of aperture. They were looking for aperture, but they were absolutely focused on an aperture. And after a while, there was movement across that boundary of apertures, which was most compelling about it. And I was thinking when you were talking about the removal of the skin of the of the uh, Polaroid image, so that what we had here was a series of, of skins which were the interface between two apertures, the aperture of the camera, the aperture of the, the, uh, the building, of the, uh, of the window, or the door. And the people, and the figures between. The figures yeah, between yeah, exactly, room. that's absolutely right, yeah. yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, and, you know, you, and you were talking about kind of film editing. You've talked about film editing a little bit in passing, but it seems like what you were doing was kind of like what a film editor does, right? You have a bunch of material and then you try and put it together. Did, did that feel more okay than adding the words to it? You know, oh, I see what you mean. Um, yes. <laughs> um, because I think they were already finished. I mean, there was something not that I couldn't change about the actual picture. It was sitting there, a complete thing. So when I moved it, I didn't actually do anything to it. It was the selection of the pictures, because there were 87 and there, I've I broke it way down, that was the most um, sort of interfering from my point of view, was when I chose to leave some out. And I, I mostly then, at that point, focused on the children around the door, rather than um, there, was, there were some of just animals, a lot of things of animals going in and out. I love those animals. It's really busy yeah. Very busy. And something else keeps coming out that you never knew was there. <laughs> Well, they're made in the mind. I mean, they're in, they're in the invisibility of thought first. They, they have to pass through the cloud of the, of the interior skull to be made at all, to become sound. So to me, I use the word darkness or silence for that, where they come from. So you're not pulling them in. You're always sending them out. In the book, um, where he says about the in and out. The door and the yes, I do. I do see a relationship between that. The, of the, uh, but it's it's a visual representation of the same idea. Yeah. Okay, I will ask a question. What's the relationship um, between your verbal practice in in respect of these images and the idea of capture? I know. You mean hunting and capturing. Well, I was just thinking, yes, and it seems that evidently, in some way, what you're doing is, like, is more oblique um, than caption, which has a tendency to try to uh, nail down interpretation. That's right, yeah. No, I really wanted to avoid that. Mm. But I, there were points at which I was actually, you could tell I was coming in dialogue with it. But, but by and large, I didn't want to do that. We were talking last night with Rosanna Warren about the problem of words and image, and she said, oh, well, it's a perpetual conflict. It'll never be solved. 
And that may, she may be absolutely right. But that's, you can't. I mean, the beauty of film is people speak. But the, the, the um, rejecting part of film, if you're working with it, is that you can't find it saying anything. <laughs> so, sort of a definite paradox. If you're used to words. Did you think about ethnographic film? Oh, sorry, did someone have a question? Someone back there. Uh, in your search for structure, was your motivation in finding a structure that reflected the culture or that reflected how it made you feel? How do you I, it was again the thing I do in all, everything I do is try to find that one completely impersonal point where the image set, it could be understood by Plato as much as anyone else. So I noticed that the children in particular had these beautiful positions they took completely. You know, so, so I was looking for those ones, the more fixed in an antiquity in a way. And children are abandoned in that wonderful, useful way. Because when you were describing, right, you were describing the movie, your photos around, you also write a lot of sequences and poems. So I'm just I'm curious to hear more about how you approach. It, it seems like there's, you have an interest in sequencing. Maybe it's narrative or something like that. An interest in sequencing of sort of squares of things. Like That's like right. Poems or whether they're illusion. So I'm just curious to hear more about that. Like, was, was, is there any, maybe, maybe there's something in common with what you were doing? When you're moving the photos around on the table, but I wonder if there is when, when you go about sequencing some of your longer groups of poems. Sometimes and some of them have sort of very box-like, right? Set them mm -hmm. lines or things like that. And That's right. How do you think about that? Well, it would be just what you're saying. It would be the same of um, trying to see uh, links, so that in one, if I said red here. And, but I had blue over there. I would try to um, work on those two so they echoed each other in some way. So it's looking for an echo that brings everything into one. And we hope it's like a spiral more than a circle. So it keeps passing the same things all the way down. It doesn't leave them behind. But there's a natural point of exhaustion too where that is fulfilled and then you leave it. I, and I wouldn't be able to describe when, when that happens. Do you have to write your sequence? I think sequence is a fun word too, because there's two ways. You could write something in the sequence, like one after the other, and leave it that way. Or you could write. Helter like, Skelter. Helter Skelter and then after. I do a lot of Helter Skelter. <laughs> <laughs> be completely honest. Because then, then I'm surprised that this thing was just like right. that thing. So then they call to each other. Right. And well, I, kind of right, exactly. That's right. Definitely depersonalizing. Yes. Would you feel differently if someone came to you with a series of sounds or <clears throat> short pieces of music and wanted some sort of words to connect with them? I would want them to be sung then. I wouldn't want to tear the words out of the music. I think. I mean, I listen to Benjamin Britten. Your, your um, sequence of poems asks when you describe you know, what you envision a poetic structure to be. Um, so did you write, I'd be curious, I mean, it seems like in a way that, was that written after you spent all this time with these photographs, or was that no, just that was, amazing it, harmony? It was a coincidence again. It was written probably five years before that. Wow. Yeah, because that, that ha there's no actual door. Right? I know, door yeah. Away. But so thinking of that as a poetic structure that has this formal constraint and wall, but this open, Open, you know, That's right. 
Uh, I know, it's just, it just came out. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It, it strikes me that this is a lot like making abstract art. There's no specific way of doing it. You just have to play and somehow it comes together or it doesn't and, and you have to fix it. Well, I think if you've done work with the material of words long enough, they have such a history for you that there is always um, just the way with colors for painters. There's a huge basement full of associations with every set of words you put together. So for me, it, um, it isn't quite abstract, almost. But I do think that, if, if that when you've worked with something for a long time, it does have its own logic. And I also did write novels for years, so there is my love of plot and story. I can't get rid of that. Yes? This isn't quite organized yet, but I, have, I guess I have a question about snapshots and about the snapshot as sort of the kind of image and what that has to do with writing. Um, one thing I was thinking about while, while looking at these images is the kind of uh, the complex nature of the snapshot and that it has both a lot of stillness and a lot of movement in it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 an, it's an image from a sequence of other images that are missing. Um, and so there's uh, something has happened and something is going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's right. This image. But it's also, it's, there's a certain autonomy to a good snapshot. It has to be a good snapshot. But, um, um, yeah, so something about the, the strange sort of enjambment of autonomy and sequentiality in one image. Um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm curious if that has anything to do with your writing. Well, I think it was definitely his experiment was just to see what would happen if you had that black blackout every, every few seconds. And how quickly do people change? their positions and what, why, and all of that. So I was really um, working with him. It was really a collaboration that way, that I was trying to see what he felt when he looked at his pictures and saw them, and then just put them away and didn't really see them. So um, I think uh, it's, it is that thing of the autonomous stanza or, or sentence. I mean, I sort of think of a sentence as a word, so like Sanskrit or something, that one sentence in a poem is a unit of sound and of, of an image all strung together. And so when I um, am writing, I am thinking of autonomous pieces that then would echo each other. I mean, it's not as laborious as it sounds. <laughs> I mean, it just sort of happens like that. But I do, in my mind, I do, that sentence to me is a word. Could you talk about some of the other collaborations you've done and how they might be similar or different from this one? Um, well, the only other collaboration I did was with a French filmmaker named Babette Mengold, who <coughs> teaches film at San Diego. And when I was there, I made a film of Simone Weil based on her one portion of her notebook, um, a kind of mysterious portion. of um, She was a French philosopher and who um, was very important during the war, and she died um, in 1943. She um, left behind these amazing notebooks uh, and which is her entire work, really, um, on which she's known are these random notes. And there was one that she had that was kind of strangely um, personal. And I took that and um, made, did some shots and all of that and arranged it. And then I went to Babette and said, um, can you help me? And she said, we've well, done it all wrong. <laughs> you have to start. You start with the words. You don't. 
start with image. So she sat down with me, we redid the entire script part, and then, and then she helped me organizing the images. But um, I never forgot that, that that would be the right way to do it. And then you were forced to do it the wrong way. The other way, exactly. <laughs> or I wanted to try. <laughs> Yes. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you so much for sharing that. that all of that is so wonderful. Thank um, you. And I, I was struck by, you, you mentioned synesthesia a lot uh, throughout uh, your reading, and, and obviously images and text. And it seemed to also be a strong presence at the end um, in your description of age and decay and things like that. And could you, could you talk a little bit more about how those things Flow together at the end of yes, it's more. I've gotten um, really uh, interested in. Well, I have always been too aware that there's a thin line between being horrified by something and and thinking it's wonderful. And so there's a kind of life of terrified living on that edge between those two. And then, um, as you get older, you do thin it. Th there is this stage when a, bod a person is actually literally dying, called the thinning by priests in Ireland. And you're not supposed to interfere when the patient is saying they see beautiful things. You're not supposed to say, oh, come back, come back. You're supposed to let them go at that point. But it's interestingly called the thinning because it is your, all your um, defenses drop away. And um, so you're, all, you're bordering, you're on that border state again, um, which is one that's interested me for years. I suppose it's so slightly insane. I mean, it's like a, <laughs> looking, looking into that jaw, but trying to keep the balance there between them. And the hardest thing, I think, to keep alive is the wonder end of the spectrum. And um, so that, that is why children are so important and how we treat them. <laughs> I was um, so alternating my attention between what you were saying and the images on the screen. And if, I've, if you've addressed the answer to my question, then I apologize for asking it again. Okay. Uh, I noticed sort of three possibilities in looking at the images. Either people are going into the door, the door is framing a person or a creature, or people are coming out. And I had the sense that there were less people coming out than there were creatures or people going in, or that they were stationary in, in the door. I never had a real sense that somebody was, or something was coming out. I wonder if that resonated with your experience in the making, or maybe I'm just off base, or if you noticed perhaps more people going in than coming out, or... I did, yeah. I, and then one suddenly emerged at the end who, who <laughs> had never been there before. <laughs> yes, it was completely mystifying, that whole question. The mother was, did come in and out, mm -hmm. but there was one little child holding a station there the door throughout, basically. And then an older boy who, who would stand watching with the little one. So there were a few familiar, but generally, the things I took out were a lot of, of black doors with a hen going in and out, and, and no person. But it's true, several people disappeared and never came back. <laughs> And we'll never know. It's really a different experience watching this particular video. With the, you see this sort of the ghost fading away or coming out. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to imagine looking at Polaroids, which they have this white border. That's oh, right. They're like a frame. And so I, I was thinking of that when you were talking about the tarot cards, which I think also have a sort of white border. They do. But, but here, it would be almost like giving a linear tarot reading where the Four of Cups becomes a different card while you're looking at it. That's it right, exactly right. Yeah. Another. No, that's really right. Yeah. Theoretically, there's a whole other writing project here in the DVD mm -hmm. format of, you know, 
of that fluidity between you. That's right, yeah. It was really fun doing yeah. this and surprising just the way you're describing it. I, I had thought I would just talk about it as the book, but then that was not interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was interested when you talked about weakening and, and even slouching in a seat, and, and I was wondering what, and then I was thinking about how you describe poetic structure as a house, like a well-wrought house that you, but that takes work to build a house. So there's like, on the one hand, weakening and slouching, and then, but also working and constructing and building something that you can maybe slouch in, because you can rest in a house. And how, how does that relate to what you were just saying about on the being on the border between um, the the beauty and the horror of, in, in, like, is your poetic practice incorporate both of those that work, but also weakening? It does. I mean, I think it does. It's. I read this beautiful quote by um, Ketza, the the South African writer who who did a lot of work on Holderlin's poetry, mm -hmm. and he was looking at the endless revisions that Holderman would do. He would throw away a whole poem and start it over again. And he was, ta he said, he was talking about the, the search for a, an interior structure that's stable and that you are always doing that and that he could see it more clearly in this process of Holderman's than he had ever seen it before because it actually made no sense. The first poem was perfectly good. Why did he throw it away and start over again? And so that, um, that fascinates me because I think that is the fluidity the, um, and the search for the piece of structure that's so mysterious about work, artistic work. What, what are you looking for? You don't even know what you're looking for. Or how can you recognize it when it's there? So it's such a mystery. That is the fluidity, I would say. And what you were saying with the tarot card, with the one image floating into others. I know. And so, so I know. Does that consume you in terms of it does. My role should be in terms of uh, I just believe in resistance in of the individual. And resistance can take the form of just being the observer, writing down what you say. There isn't much one person can do, but you can resist. I just find it just overwhelming. It is. I know, it's every city in America is like this. Baltimore, I mean, it's unbelievable. Shocking, I totally agree with you. I think we have to resist. I think you just are always on being vigilant for the infractions because they're everywhere and you just don't give in to them as much as possible without dying. There are ways to resist. You just don't get up if they tell you to get up. Ferdinand just now denounced everything, and that's, I guess, Ferdinand Cruz. When you, when you, he pops up in front of national TV cameras, and he, and he, and he takes us down this fantasy world that he's, that he's completely consumed with, and then as a poet, you. And up and say that's the mouset type of lunacy or what? I think you you do actually. Or I think you encourage young people to get up and find a place for them to go get up and say their poems or or do play their instruments. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. I just didn't want to turn it into a no. 
No, I don't blame you. It's completely horrible. It's a nightmare. I agree with you. One way, you were kind of talking about how you didn't want it to just become like an ethnographic kind of, you know, right. um, you know, tenderness toward these Im imperiled people. Let's protect them by leaving them alone, kind of thing. Um, but th there is, it's so it's such a political kind of um, minefield that you enter into by you know, cap captioning or, you know, uh, writing into those. Exactly. No, absolutely. The most important thing was to realize, that, as I said to you earlier, that they were not just leftover people wandering blindly around. They were in a, in a position of resistance. They were taking every day, repeating their rituals, making sure everything was all right, and going deeper and deeper into the mountains to get away from the modern world. So it was a continual political action. Did you have some in conversations with Gardner about how he was imagining his own project in taking those? Because even those photos are kind of ethnography, right? Mm -hmm. a right, way yeah. Of writing that uh, world. Well, that has been sort of his obsession is trying to um, he, he hasn't really made anything much since then, since the 80s. But he was always going into imperiled communities to see were they choosing to live like this in such um, solitude and so separate from everything. Was it a choice or was it they had been driven to that point? And, and then it often became a kind of religious practice that they were enacting that kept them safe. So ritual was, is the most, the greatest form of resistance for him. And that's sort of what he shows in all his films, is that exact same story. And there's also an art aspect to his anthropological work, right? Because there's a, there's a beautiful conceptual art way of reading that, mm -hmm. taking photographs every 20 seconds. That's like right. Polaroid of one doorway, right? Um, does he think about the aesthetics of what he's doing? Uh, he's funny. He won't acknowledge that part of himself. Yeah. He's very um, matter of fact. He said, no, I just happened to be there. I wanted to try it. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. go in towards theory at all. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think there might be a problem with the conception of resistance? In other words, if something is so much inscribed as other, it's very easy to, I mean, for, for us looking at it, to see it as an instance of resistance, whereas the resistance which um, bears most fruit day after day is in a sense invisible. It's not inscribed as otherness in that very direct sense. I, I was just thinking anecdotally about a, a visit to Laza, where I was struck that on the one hand you had elderly people going around with their rosaries and so on and so on. But the real resistance I encountered was in local monasteries where young kids wearing American sports gear were still insisting on maintaining uh, traditions, but also saying, we're not religious. This is about being good people. And being good people meant holding on to some kind of, well, holding on to the language, holding on to a tradition. But if you were to take photographs of that, these would look like people who have been c completely corrupted by Western mm. consumers. Mm, that's fascinating, yeah. Fascinating. No. I think, I think um, it is the, the whole thing of holding on to some order from some tradition is very critical. It can't just all be tossed out if you want to move forward or stay where you are. Yes. Um, can you talk about doubt um, in the making of an individual poem, and then also um, more broadly, do you ever doubt the value of poetry, um, maybe in relation to politics, 
Um, and if so, how do you how do you work through that? I I do, of course, doubt. <laughs> and, and its usefulness, or if it's just a waste of time, and how, what a horrible thought to think I just wasted my life writing poems. Um, that's why it helps to teach, because at least when you teach, you know you've done something. But when you, you know it's it's a good good thing to do. But um, but the writing you can't uh, justify, really. I don't think there's any way to, the thing is it's usually a compulsion and there's not, nothing else you can do. So it's just another um, obsessional madness really just to go around doing that. So I have no justification for it at all. Any other questions for Adam? No. It is beyond that. <laughs> On to cookies? Yeah, we have to make cookies. <laughs> okay, well, it's cookie time. Thank you.